Hello everyone, my name is Tim Lineman and I'm your instructor for uh, Business Ethics Online, uh, Philosophy 360. Um, and uh, in this video I'm going to say hello and introduce you to the class and introduce you to uh, our Canvas website and how everything's going to happen. And the first thing I want to say is that this video might go a little long. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. I'm going to try to keep this efficient, um, but I have a lot of things I want to share with you and there's a lot of things that we should talk about about setting up the class and how everything is going to work. So um, the first thing that I, I, I really want to talk about is um, the online class format. So uh, I've taught online classes before and uh, this is my first time doing it with business ethics so this there might be some rocky stuff along the way and if, if there's issues going on uh, definitely um, let's talk about it I'm definitely open to that I want to tailor this class to suit uh, your needs and uh, to help enable you to have the most success that you can with this class in a lot of different ways not just like passing it but also getting the most out of it um, and that's kind of what fuels a lot of my thinking about um, doing an online class. I predominantly do brick and mortar classroom kinds of settings and I've always um, really appreciated the kind of personal contact that you get with that and you don't have that with online as much. I'm going to try to take some steps to, to make that happen as best as I can and I'll talk about all those things but that I want to let you know that that's pretty uh, firmly on my radar is like trying to do whatever we can with the online class to make uh, the sort of online aspects of it, try to minimize or ameliorate as many of those concerns as possible and get you as much of a robust experience as we can in this format. That's my kind of number one priority with the course design. Um, I actually want to share a little anecdote. Uh, when I was, um, and I've got some experience doing this stuff. I, like I said, I've taught other online cl classes before, especially Philosophy 101, a very similar type of class as this one. Uh, where you're reading lots of readings and having discussion about it or hoping to have discussion about it and unpacking some complicated ideas and theories. Um, and I'm going to be borrowing a lot of the elements that I found that worked successfully with that 101 online here. But like I said, this is a new update. But when I was first putting together that online 101 class and I was concerned about all these online things, I actually went around and just interviewed a lot of students, uh, some that were my students, but also just students that I met around campus and you know, I just struck up conversations about their online experiences as much as possible. And one, there was one message I wasn't expecting that I got quite frequently. And it was something like, oh, I can't take online classes anymore because I, I know how I am in an online setting and it's, just, it doesn't, it's not going to work for me. Um, and they mostly, what they had in mind with it not working was something like how um, the online class doesn't do as much to kind of force you to engage on a regular basis. Um, if you're in a classroom sort of thing, you have to show up every day and do all this stuff and there's some kind of mechanisms in the class itself to encourage you to stay engaged and, and to stay investing in the class as the quarter uh, draws on. And um, so that seems to be an issue and that might not be for you, uh, but it might, some of you, this might be something that you could know about or you might know your tendencies or your concern about that. I want to do everything in my power to try to encourage um, engagement with the class. And this class is a pretty hefty one. Um, there's going to be a lot of tough readings. There's going to be a lot of tough ideas. Um, I've also taught this uh, 360, um, this version of business ethics for the accounting program a few times now. It's uh, my fifth year doing that. No, 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 that's not quite right fourth, maybe my fourth, third or fourth year. Um, I can't remember exactly. Um, and I've, in my experience teaching this class to the accounting students, is that this is a little bit of a change of pace for you in your studies. And the class um, is going to maybe test some limits in, in ways that maybe you're not um, uh, getting as much contact with. So um, a lot of support I found in the past has been really, really helpful to students. And I want to make all those sources of support, or as much as I can, available to my online students as well, because we don't get to see each other on a regular basis and, and talk about stuff. So that's kind of the overarching idea. And something I share with all my students on the first day in any class I teach is I really want to um, impress on you how open and accessible I want to be uh, as your instructor. So. Um, seeking out conversation and help and stuff like that outside of 
the official parameters of the class is something I very much want to encourage. I think it'll add a lot to your experience of the class, help you get more out of it. Um, and that, and I want to do everything on my end of that uh, equation to like open up those opportunities. And the first thing is to just tell you how much willingness I have to do that. Talking with students outside of class is my favorite thing about being a teacher. Um, so you're never bothering me. You're not bugging me uh, if you're contacting me or having phone calls, things like that. And in fact, here, let me pull up the uh, syllabus. This is the front page. This is the home page of our Canvas site. And it's got the syllabus here. And you'll notice, uh, here we go. Here's my uh, contact information. And you're going to have my personal cell phone number. And another email that I like to use. This is my uh, kind of an email account I've made just for my teaching. Um, I do have a personal email, but there's uh, unfortunately there's another Tim Lineman at gmail.com that's spelled very similarly, and students were messing that up a lot. And this Tim Lineman is kind of a jerk, so I stopped <laughs> giving that email just to kind of deal with that. But you've got this one from me um, that's just tailored for you. And I give you this contact information because I want you to use it. Um, texting me, calling me, totally open. If I can't talk to you, I'll, I'll just get back to you as soon as I can or try to send you a text message letting you know what's up with me. Um, but I, I really want to be very, very accessible. I, I think, like I said, this class uh, benefits from a lot of support, students getting a lot of support, um, and I want to encourage that uh, through first with me. The second part is with you. Um, Self-advocacy is uh, something I've learned as a student is a very important skill in your tool belt as a student. Knowing when and, and a willingness to reach out to instructors and uh, get support when you need it. Um, and even if you don't need it too, if you just want to get more out of the class. If you want to invest more, I want to match your investment too. But um, reaching out and um, getting access uh, to resources um, to help make your experience a more profitable one, a more effective one, a more successful one is something I very much want to encourage on your part too. You might already know about yourself that you're good at doing that and so I'd say I'm the best, uh, or I try to be the, one of the best instructors that's going to uh, make that shine and, and produce something of a lot of value. And if you know that you're not a student who does um, a lot of self-advocacy or that's not something that you've done a lot in the past, Give it a try this quarter. Try it out with me. Uh, I hope to prove to you in my actions and not just with my words um, that I'm here to help you and support you. And I think especially like with all this online stuff that I was mentioning, um, that's especially relevant for, for our class here. Okay, so getting into the course itself. Um, I do have uh, some descriptions here. I'll have you, I, I would encourage you to read the syllabus here on your own. But I can say some things here about how I approach teaching this class um, and some of the things that you can expect out of it. And probably the first thing to say is this. Um, business ethics is a course that gets taught sometimes by a philosophy department, like with me, I'm a philosopher. I'm not a businessman. <laughs> That's a, definitely a big thing to say. I'm not teaching this class because I have a tremendous amount of experience or skill in the business world. I'm not an accountant, although I actually have been training myself to be an accountant. I'll mention that sometime. Um, I've been actually picking up some accounting skills over the last few years uh, with the volunteer work I do with the church I go to, um, which has no one to do it, so I've done it. <laughs> so I'm actually learning more and more about accounting. But you're taking this class from me because I have experience and skill and uh, ability in ethics. That's my area of specialization, and that's where uh, that's why I'm teaching this class. But sometimes it gets taught by philosophers like me. Um, other times, though, this class gets taught by business departments. And in my experience, those two classes, even if they go by the same name, even if the school treats them as the same credits, they're very, very different experiences. And this is a little bit of an overgeneralization, but in my experience, when a business ethics class is taught by the business department, it usually devolves into something like, here are the rules, don't mess up, right? Like, play by the rules, don't, don't do these bad things. Here's a list of don'ts, you know, like, don't do those things. Um, and it's all pretty straightforward stuff. It's nothing uh, deeply controversial. Sometimes you might get into a little controversy, but the focus is more about just informing you about the law and uh, certain uh, expectations in the business world for proper conduct and this kind of thing. 
That's not how I'm going to be teaching the class. We will get into some of those issues, but the way that I've designed the curriculum, and this is how I, I think generally, if you, if you get the class taught by a philosopher, an ethicist, it does take more of this character, is that class is instead going to be focusing on disagreement. So those sorts of issues, ethical, ethical issues that show up in the business world that we don't, we're, we're not all seeing eye to eye on. We're not on the same page about it. Uh, issues that uh, generate controversy and rational disagreement, which is a theme I'll probably talk about soon here um, with some of the lectures coming up this week. Um, so we're gonna we're not gonna focus on the low hanging fruit here or learning this kind of like Sunday school format of this is the right thing to do, this is the wrong thing to do kind of stuff, but instead focusing on giving you by focusing on controversy giving you the resources to be able to do your own independent ethical thinking and moral reasoning and to be able to respect and understand why uh, there are some really tricky things to deal with. Um, I'm, I kind of think about this not just, uh, the, the class is going to have a lot of theory in it and I'll, I'll talk about the structure of the class. We're going to kind of kick off the quarter with, a, with just ethical theory to like build up our conceptual vocabulary for understanding ethical issues. But there is a focus here on application. It's not all purely theoretical. But it's sort of my belief, it's my philosophy, I guess you could say, as a teacher of this class and this curriculum, that having an understanding of the theoretical components and the controversial stuff increases your ability to be able to deal with novel applied cases in a much more effective way. That if life does throw you into moral dilemmas, um, circumstances you might find yourself in where you have to make a very difficult judgment call where ethical and moral issues are very relevant to that decision, um, that you are able to think through that novel ethical problem. You've got some more resources for understanding what's happening here, for tracking the things that are relevant to that decision. And you've got ways of untangling to to figure out what course of action you're going to take and to be able to articulate your defense of that. Like why would you think that choice is justified? To be able to explain that to other people or to kind of hold yourself personally accountable but then also publicly accountable. Um, if you have to make one of these tough judgment calls it'll probably be controversial and people will challenge or question your choice. Um, there might be all sorts of ways in which systems of accountability you'll have to square off against. And will you be able to tell people, here's why I did what I did and here's why I think it is right, and to make the case for it. That kind of end goal is part of my ambitions with this class. Um, it is also to increase your moral and ethical sensitivity. Sometimes that's a big part of it. Um, but the class, um, when I've taught it in the past, and, and to be perfectly candid uh, with the accounting program in particular, I'm used to having to give a sort of defense or a justification for why this class matters and why it's worth devoting all of the energy and effort that the class will ask out of you this quarter. Um, there, I, I, I recognize the need to kind of give an argument for that. And what I just was talking about I think goes some of the way toward making that argument, but I hope to be able to do more of that continually throughout the whole quarter. Um, ethics is not easy. Um, in my experience as a teacher of ethics with a number of classes and working with students, I've been teaching for nine years now, I think, uh, including student teaching. And I'm used to uh, a kind of reaction from a lot of students of like, I've got a conscience. I know right from wrong. Um, I know not to do terrible things to people, abuse them, exploit them, blah, blah, blah. Um, but morality is a lot more than that. Ethics is a lot more than that. In my experience as a student of it and uh, as a, philo a moral philosopher, I think ethics is pretty messy um, and it's not easy to resolve questions. And even a question about whether there is objectivity to issues of justice uh, and moral obligation is itself a question that we'll be talking about too um, and trying to see the understanding of, of why would we have confidence that there is some answers here and what are the ways that we would figure out those answers. Uh, issues of fundamental ethical justification are uh, some of the stickiest things to deal with in, in uh, moral philosophy and we're, gonna, we're going pretty ambitious here in this class in terms of um, 
not playing like kindergarten ethics or something like that, or like like I said, the Sunday school thing a second ago, but really digging into this stuff, uh, diving into the deep end, if you will. Um, so I'm very excited about this class for that reason. I love uh, my experiences teaching this class in the past, and especially with the accounting students, I've had wonderful, wonderful experiences um, every time I've taught this class with them, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to meeting all of you and getting to know you and working with you this quarter, too. Okay, so let's take a look. At, that's a bit of a broad overview. Maybe we'll have a chance to talk more um, about the course uh, in the first couple weeks here. Um, there's going to be some opportunity for you to be able to ask me questions directly as a part of just the structure of the class. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping, I, that's, a, that's something I've always really appreciated about the brick and mortar thing. And I hope we can replicate some of that with this online setting too. If at any point in this quarter you're like, this class seems like bullshit. I don't know why I'm taking this class or like why I should be putting a lot of effort into it or something like that. Please voice those concerns to me. Give me the chance to make a case. I would very much appreciate that gesture um, and helping to make this stuff come alive and to understand why it might matter to study it and it, at the level of depth that we are going to do it. Um, so you can expect from this class um, pretty heavy readings. Uh, a kind of theoretic, a deep theoretical approach, and controversy, exploring the issues of moral disagreement that we have when it comes to the business world. And there actually is quite a lot of that. Um, when I have class discussions with this class, it can sometimes get pretty heated. So <laughs> uh, maybe we can replicate some of that too. I think that really adds to the experience. Okay. Without further ado, let's get to. Uh, some stuff about how the class is going to be structured and how everything is going to happen on Canvas. So let me pull that back up. Okay. Um, so here's the home page, and I've got the syllabus here. Um, let's talk through, let, let's, let's use a grading here to kind of talk about the different elements of the course and how it's going to work. Oh, that oh, things got weirdly set here. Um, this should, there's a list here. We've got class attendance and participation. There is a way in which attendance will be a part of things here. Uh, reading comments and journals are going to be two regular uh, writing assignments you'll be doing for me throughout the quarter. They'll be part of the regular workflow of the, of the class. Um, there's going to be a presentation of sorts, although we'll have to talk about how that's going to be different in the online setting. And then these two papers. Um, the research paper is the really big project that you'll be working on this quarter for me. And then there's also going to be this response paper option. Uh, or not option, you'll have to do it, but a, a kind of a follow-up to the research paper. Um, so one of the big things you'll, you'll be working on for me is an original philosophy paper where you're going to take up some ethical issue of controversy that's in the business world. Um, you'll be crafting a position about that, making arguments to defend it, dealing with your opponents, reacting to objections, responding to, <laughs> not reacting, but responding critically to concerns of your opponents, whoever disagrees with you on this issue. Um, and then uh, after those are created, they'll be due a little bit before the end of the quarter. Um, and then I'll be doing this anonymous exchange and you'll write a little commentary paper on someone else's paper from the class um, where you'll kind of evaluate their arguments, add some of your own. Um, we're kind of replicating a little bit some of the way in which professional philosophy is done, where people write papers, give talks about them, and then there's usually, at like a philosophy conference, if someone's giving a paper, there'll be someone with prepared remarks in response. So uh, I think this is kind of a really cool, unique thing about how uh, academics and philosophy happens, where there's always sort of the other side, right? There's always, it's not just me telling you about my ideas, but there's someone else who's like, so you just heard some things from this guy, but keep this stuff in mind too, right? There's some other stuff going on, and then they usually have Q&A like a, a normal conference would, but that the fact that there's a prepared responder there I think is really cool, and we're going to be kind of replicating a little bit of that, a little bit of a kind of an intellectual community that we're going to have this quarter, and this will be another way to participate that way. There's some other options too. Okay, um, so more on these uh, as the quarter goes on here. I'll be giving you a lot of support with how to do this and how to write a philosophy paper. It's a little different than writing other types of papers. But let's talk about the regular stuff. So first up, let's talk about class attendance and participation. Now I'm going to move to a different part of the Canvas site here. Um, their uh, discussions will be a big part of this. Um, but the main thing that you'll want to always kind of go to here 
um, in Canvas is the modules page. So most of the class will be sort of working through these modules. This one is not the best example, these first two, but all these other topics, this is going to be a better example. Fiduciary duties, whistleblowing affirmative action, international business, social and economic justice, and then success in the American dream. These units are going to be the main meat of business ethics. Um, these first two modules are about kind of set up to the class, uh, introduction to ethics itself. Um, like I said, we're, we're going to be studying some ethical theory here to increase our conceptual vocabulary for understanding what's going to be happening in these more particular issues that have to do with business ethics uh, explicitly. Um, this stuff is not explicitly about business ethics, but it's sort of the backdrop in which all that stuff is going to happen. But there's going to be readings, and the readings will show up in the modules. Um, there are going to be these little uh, quizzes, I'll talk about that more in a second, and some writing activities. Um, there will also usually, and this is why this is going to be a little bit more relevant for the module, <clears throat> there are going to be uh, discussion forums where I'll be asking you to post things. Um, so we'll talk about, let's, uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves though. Let's go one thing at a time. So in the major uh, flow of the course, we'll be working on these modules in a linear fashion, sort of one at a time. And there will be a bunch of readings. There's going to be a lot of reading in this class. And it's tough reading. Um, I, I give you these readings not always because they're going to make, uh, it's not always that they're going to just like read right off the page and you'll be able to understand everything that's going on in them. I'm really expecting that they're going to be a struggle. And that in the lectures I'm going to give, and there's going to be a lot of video lectures, um, I'm going to be trying to unpack that for you and we can talk about it a little bit. And that's the first big thing about the way the class is going to work. So uh, this is a tentative arrangement. I might have to mess with this. Like I said, this, this is going to be kind of a, a trial run doing the class on the online format. This might be one of the things that will have to be adjusted. But right now, my plan is every uh, Tuesday and Thursday night, at, starting tomorrow, actually. So if you can show up, that'd be cool. But every Tuesday and Thursday night at 8 PM, I'm going to get on Google Hangouts, which is actually what I'm using right now. I'm the only one in this Google Hangout right here. Um, but I'll be doing my lectures as a kind of video chat. And you'll be able to show up and, and watch my lecture live and ask questions live and engage and kind of replicating an online classroom experience like, like you would in a classroom um, as much as possible. I'll be recording them like I'm doing right now and then posting the video lectures on YouTube. So if you uh, are able to come live, great and you can get all the lecture content that way. If you're not able to, because schedules are all over the place since 8 o'clock, I know. I tried to pick a time that I thought might be able, that worked the best when I did the online 101 before in terms of people's schedules and work and everything. Um, so I'm thinking most people would be able to show up for that, but not everyone will be able to. And there'll be a way for you to watch the video lectures on your own time uh, through YouTube. Um, but what will happen is whether you watch it live or on YouTube later recorded, uh, you'll go to these um, little quizzes here. Let me let me open up this one. You'll, there'll be a little online quiz, and it's a quiz with only one question on it. Uh, I'll give you a code word at some point during the lecture. I'll pick I'll pick some arbitrary code word, and you will uh, take the quiz, answer the one question with the code word. And that's a way in which I'm going to be able to handle attendance. So um, that'll be uh, that'll be the way that I'll be able to see. Yeah, you watched the lecture, or you were there for the lecture, and I'll give you credit for it. Um, usually, uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, whether you're watching it live or later, you'll hear the code word at some point during the lecture, and then you'll just be able to jump into the quiz, put the code word down, bing, bing, boom. And there we go. So attendance is a part of your grade um, because I think what, normally I'd say this when I'm doing the brick and mortar classroom. I like to give a lot of points for attendance in terms of your final grade because so much of the class happens in the classroom. Like I said, the readings are great. I think they're really rich and dense, but they're also really tough. And unpacking them, especially if you're not familiar with moral philosophy or just philosophy in general and the kind of theory that we're going to be dealing with, it might not be very accessible. And my job as your instructor is to make it accessible. And that's what's going to happen in these video lectures. So I think they're very important to stay on top of those. You want to 
have the reading done ahead of time if at all possible. The lectures make way more sense if you've got some background struggling with the reading with, on your own first. Um, so I highly, highly recommend that. Readings in this class are not really optional and it's very tempting in an online class to just kind of, there's a lot of ways in which you kind of fake things in this class um, and it's very hard for me to design it in a way that's not going to work that way and I don't want to do policey sort of things like reading quizzes to test comprehension and crap like that. That's not my style. Um, I like to instead encourage students to have natural motivation for investing in the class rather than artificial grade mechanisms. There is this thing about the uh, attendance quiz about that's about as mechanical as I want to get with it but there will be that. So that's one main component to how the class flow is going to happen. Twice a week I'm going to do these video lectures, record them, and they'll be available. And they will be long. They'll probably be around two hours um, to try to replicate the amount of time we would have in a class setting. That's how long uh, four hours, four and a half hours of classroom time a week is what I've got with my brick and mortar version of business ethics. And I want you to get the full experience. I don't want you to get some watered down things. So they will be longer. Um, but there's a lot of material to chew through. So uh, we'll, we'll definitely use all of that space. Um, okay, so we've got the attendance quizzes. We also have, um, with every single reading that's going to happen once we get past this first unit, there are going to be these, what I'm calling reading comment assignments. And the, there's one linked with every single reading. So you can see here in the fiduciary duty module, we've got the uh, reading from a philosopher named Friedman, Boatwright, Hosnas. You may have actually heard of Milton Friedman before. He's kind of uh, well known. But there are going to be these discussion uh, boards that are linked with each of the readings. And what you're going to do is after doing the reading, uh, you'll go onto the discussion board and you'll post a comment that's going to have, um, actually here, let me pull up the syllabus. I'll show you what I'm talking about. I got a description here for this assignment um, in the syllabus. Um, so you'll, you'll put at least three short questions or comments. Um, and these are uh, not supposed to be super long. Like I say, I intend for them to be merely a couple sentences at minimum. You can be longer if you want to. You can do more than three if you want to. But they're, the, the reading comments are not like, I did the reading, let me prove it to you. So in other words, I don't want you doing things with the reading comments like just summarizing the points of the paper. The intention here is that reading comment assignments are kind of they're, going, they're actually going to do a bunch of things for us in the class, but the main thing is they're trying to encourage you to be an active reader. So what I mean by that is that as you're doing the reading, you're trying to think for yourself, like, do I agree with this or not? What do I think of these ideas? Um, what are my opinions about them? What are my reactions, critical reactions to them for positive or for negative? Um, positive criticism is another thing, like being able to weigh the merits of something in addition to its problems is both a part of critical reasoning. Um, in philosophy, we don't take things on authority, especially in moral philosophy. We're always asking for the arguments. And you're really going to be in the driver's seat. This is sometimes one of the things that's weird and different about philosophy with, with, with students, is that you're asked to really think about this for yourself. You're not being told this is, this is ethics or something like that. So these reading common assignments are trying to get you to think about what are your reactions to the text? What's, what's sort of your relationship with it? And what are the things that you're not sure about? What are the questions that you have? What stuff didn't make sense? Um, and I take a look at those and they inform my lectures when I'm going to be doing these video lectures and talking about them. I'll try to be targeting the things that you're curious about. So the focus here is, is really on you. It's less about the reading. It's more about your relationship with the reading. So you'll um, so one thing is that the assignment is going to do is uh, encourage you to be an active reader, but also by posting them on this kind of discussion, it's kind of like having class discussion. You can see what other students are wondering about too, and I really encourage you to give replies to people's comments, maybe strike up some debates and discussion. That's fantastic. Um, I can tell you this much: my bandwidth this quarter, and I'm a new. I've got a one and a half year old, and we are too poor. Uh, my my partner is a therapist. I'm an adjunct teacher. We can't afford childcare, so I got a lot of childcare responsibilities. And I know from uh, all the other things I, I'm going to be doing um, that my ability to like jump in on these discussion boards and be like really active on them is pretty low. Uh, so I won't be doing tons and tons of moderating of it. Um, I'll be trying to jump in and, and watching what's going on. And of course, I'm going to be reading your comments 
for the reading comment assignments, of course. And like I said, those will be informing my my uh, lectures too. But I definitely encourage you to to get on there and and talk with each other if you want to. That's that's another kind of advantage that this assignment has is it, it'll perform that function for us in the class too. So you've got regular readings. Um, that you'll do the reading comment assignments on these discussion posts. You'll have the video lectures, um, and you'll put uh, you'll go onto the quizzes for those to put in the code words to show that you watch the video. Those are going to be kind of the bread and butter. And then there's one other assignment that we're going to be doing on a regular basis, and that's these journal entries. Um, so the journal entries will be due at the end of the week on Friday um, by midnight. You'll submit these onto Canvas. There'll be assignments made for that. Let's see. I think did I already make I don't think I made one yet. Uh, we're not going to do one for the first couple weeks here um, until we get into this first major unit of business ethics, fiduciary duties. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, here we go. Um, but once we get into the kind of regular rhythm of the class, um, I will. We will. Th these are going to be a regular sort of assignment. And what's going on in the in the journals? And you can read the syllabus there in my description of it, but. The basic idea is that uh, 500 word minimum uh, for these assignments, you'll sort of spend the first third to a half of the journal um, describing uh, an idea that came up in the life of the class that week. It could be something from a reading, it could be something from a lecture, it could be something that happened on the discussion boards or just talking with me personally. Um, some issue that's happened in the life of the class, some idea, argument, position, question, something like that that uh, sort of carries your interest, uh, you're curious about, you want, you have something to say about. The first part of the journal is just explaining that idea. Try to imagine like you're writing the journal for someone who's not in the class. And you're like, I have some cool things I want to share about what I've been thinking about this week. But first, let me bring you up to speed. So it gives you some practice at articulating the philosophical ideas of other people, which is a very important skill as a philosopher to be able to be in conversation with other people's ideas and be able to describe succinctly and accurately what they are arguing, what's their thinking. And then the, the second half to two-thirds of the journal is you throwing your two cents in there. These journals can be written very informally. They don't have to be in some kind of formal academic style. And in fact, I don't want you doing that. No like intro conclusion paragraphs. Just cut to the chase. Get right into it. Um, don't waste any time. And try to try to have a dense document there. Um, but feel free to like play with this a little bit. That's part of what the journals are for, is to kind of get some practice just playing at doing some philosophy, getting in the game instead of just commenting on the sidelines about what other people are doing, but you jumping into the game a little bit too. You expressing some opinions, articulating them, formulating them, and arguing for them as much as you can. That's how you'll get the most out of these journal assignments, and they're going to be great preparation for that paper project. Um, so I really encourage you to not treat them as a hoop jumping kind of thing, but really, you know, dive into them, give them, give them their full due, uh, try to do it in a robust sort of way. Those are the main mechanisms of the online course, and I will be designing these modules uh, so that it's very clear what sort of everything that's going on. Um, there is a little writing activity in this first week that I'll be asking you to do, but a kind of a questionnaire. Uh, we can actually take a look at that here maybe at the end if we have a few minutes um, to do that. Um, there is going to be a code for this video. Uh, I will, I got to think of a code here. <laughs> I'll come up with one uh, before the video is over. But So that's the first thing that you'll have to do is uh, submit the code for watching this video. And then I've got these other readings that I want you to take a look at. Um, the really important one is this code of intellectual conduct So uh, and the syllabus, of course. Those are, I'm going to, on tomorrow's video lecture, which I will send out a link for this, um, that'll be the link to the Hangouts thing. I'll usually send out, I'll, I'll send out an email, or I'll, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll, uh, not an email because it's not with this class. I'll make a post in the announcements area. So like on here, there's a little tab for announcements. I'll post a new announcement saying, tonight's video lecture link is here. And I'll usually do that in like hour leading up to it, so like around between 7 and 8. Um, when I will start the lecture at 8, uh, I'll post that link. So you might even be able to jump in tomorrow night if you can. That's great. Um, and I'll be talking about that code of intellectual conduct. And if people are around and they have questions about the syllabus uh, or anything about the structure of the class, I'll, I'm happy to answer questions. If you've got questions for me as an instructor, I like being an open book and 
And uh, I'll tell you anything about me with a couple exceptions. Some students have pushed that in the past. Uh, there's a few questions I won't answer. Um, but ask me whatever you want. Um, if you're able to come to that session, we'll make some time for that uh, if anyone is around. Um, but the, the Code of Intellectual Conduct, that's the main reading I want you to take a look at. There's a few other ones here in this first unit. Um, the idea of justice, here there's a little uh, thought experiment from a, a philosopher, economist actually, named Amyarda Sen. He's an economist who also does uh, economic justice. Um, and uh, he's got a really cool metaphor I like about justice and showing all the, that there's all this controversy around um, what do we mean by justice? Uh, how do we think about it? What moral values do we treat that word as code for? A lot of disagreement there, a lot of diversity there. Um, there's a, a little document on egoism, which I, I, I think is interesting too, um, especially in the context of economics, business ethics. There is this kind of idea of uh, what's called uh, rational self-interest, where like what's rational for me to do is what is in my self-interest. Think like really free market libertarian types of ideals here. And in some ways, the idea of ethics might cut against that. It might be like, well, if I'm going to engage in this ethical behavior, what's in it for me kind of thing. And egoism is a very sort of ubiquitous element. There is a philosophical position in moral philosophy called uh, psychological egoism and another one called ethical egoism. You've probably heard psychological egoism before. It's this idea that every action anyone ever does is selfish. Selfishness is the underlying motive for all actions. That's what psychological egoism holds. And ethical egoism is usually kind of following up on that. Because we are unavoidably selfish about everything, totally cynical position, therefore selfishness is not unethical. There's no other alternative for how we could be. There's nothing, so it's basically saying we are selfish, hopelessly so, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's okay. Uh, if you've ever heard of um, the uh, philosopher Ayn Rand, um, maybe this idea will sound somewhat familiar to you. She is an ethical egoist. Um, this article that I have attached in the module is uh, from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Fantastic resource, best resource on the internet for, for uh, understanding philosophical ideas. It is written by professionals for professional philosophers though, so it can sometimes be a little overwhelming. Um, it can sometimes be a little deep, and I'm happy to help you unpack anything if you're, if you're tooling around on the Stanford Encyclopedia and you got questions, come to me. I'd love to talk to you about it, help you unpack it. Um, but this article is from their entry on egoism, and it's got some really good arguments. It, it, it basically is a preview here. That article is going to basically say, here's where the state of the field is at. Psychological egoism is actually not in very good uh, standing. Um, it's a very extreme thesis. It's very hard to defend, and there's a lot of reason for thinking that um, this is just not true about us. That altruistic action is possible. We don't just do things out of selfish motives, but we do have values that are genuinely uh, involving concern for others. Um, and because this is kind of a ubiquitous thing for business, this kind of like dog-eat-dog -dog world of how the market functions, uh, sometimes this can be something worth talking about. If you want to talk about it, then I definitely want to talk about it. But this reading is more optional. Okay, so um, the egoism thing more optional. So is sort of the Falk article. Uh, these are things that if you can get to them, great. I'm not going to be spending time in my video lectures this week talking about them very heavily, though. Um, but if you have questions about it, we can discuss that. Um, but the, the Falk paper is a sneak preview in case you're thinking about whether you want to read it or not. Um, even though it was written in 1956, I think it was when Falk wrote this paper. He's not a very well-known philosopher. I kind of stumbled upon this paper and I kind of am a fan of it. Um, but it feels like it could have been written yesterday. Falk is talking about, he's basically trying to defend um, optimism about being able to use rationality and reasoning to resolve moral perplexity. So in other words, by what do you mean by moral perplexity? We mean um, moral disagreement. That in our world today, there is deep disagreement about moral and ethical values and, and outlooks just in general. And how, uh, if we sort of have this initial idea of like, well, if we just think about this some more and look at the arguments, we'll be able to sort out what's the right thing to do. Like, we can get some knowledge. But then there's some people who are like, mm, I don't think so. I don't think that reason is actually capable of resolving these disagreements. Maybe these are fundamental disagreements. Maybe uh, the idea of there being a universal objective answer to moral questions is just a false hope. 
Um, that, I, that theme I will talk about in this first week. We'll talk about relativism a little bit, moral relativism versus moral realism, and issues about whether there is ultimate ethical truth or moral truth about what's right and wrong and what's good and bad. Um, that is something that we'll need to address pretty early on here. Um, but that reading, Falk is going to try to give a defensive reason. And his defensive reason is very interesting. You'll see two main points that he'll try to make once he gets to his arguments toward the end of the paper. One is that we need to change our expectations for what we're hoping for from reason. And he thinks reason isn't going to give us perfect answers. Getting that perfect moral theory that's going to settle everything, that is not something that we can hope for. But engaging in moral theorizing is important as a process. That it's, it's better to... Make your decisions carefully, re respectfully, reflectively, um, and sensitively than to make them on whim or arbitrariness or something like that. So he's, still, he's trying to defend reasoning, moral reasoning, as something that's still worth doing, even if he sort of concedes a point that the hope for a perfect ethical theory is not something we'll maybe never achieve. He says that wouldn't make moral theory irrelevant. Uh, and moral reasoning irrelevant. That's one big point. Another big point he's going to make in that paper is that we need to have an expanded notion of what does it mean to morally reason. And this is something that's kind of a, a near and dear to my heart as a philosopher, is uh, especially in moral philosophy, that reasoning is not just a matter of an intellectual ability. Uh, this class might be intellectually taxing for you, academically challenging for you too, um, but it's not just a matter of smarts. Actually, I've got a little anecdotal story to share about this. Um, a student asked me a couple years back, I was having a discussion with them outside of class, and they were like, Tim, what do you think is like the most important thing for being a good philosopher? And I think they were expecting me to say something about uh, types of uh, critical reasoning skills, analytic abilities, stuff like this. But I, I actually, I thought about it, and I was like, I, I hadn't been asked that question directly uh, quite like that. Uh, in this conversation I was having with the student. And I realized the sort of the, the position I've had for a long time, maybe without having to explicitly articulate it, was that I really am sensitive to sincerity. I think if you want to do good philosophical work, especially in ethics, that a lot of it is about the sincerity that you come to asking those questions and, and sort of meeting the challenge of it, of being like not getting... Um, maybe uh, overwhelmed by the gravity of the question, the ultimateness of these questions of meaning of life and ultimate moral obligation, um, but what, still respecting and being modest in the efforts that you can make in it, um, not trying to jump to a conclusion too fast. Um, there's a political philosopher who t teaches law at Stanford who said, um, I saw an interview with him, and he was like, my students are always looking for loopholes, like quick, easy answers. Uh, and there's one particular answer I'm very familiar with in this class that works that way. And it's this idea that uh, there's not really a conflict here of acting ethically in business and being effective in business. Because if you're unethical, people aren't going to do business with you. If, you, if, you. if people know that you're doing unethical things all the time, an unethical business is not market viable. And that's way too quick uh, for a lot of reasons we'll get into. But that kind of like quick answer being like, there isn't a real problem here about ethics. This isn't a big concern because there's actually not a conflict here. Um, there, I think there is. And I think a lot of moral issues are that way, that we might look for quick answers about what's the right thing to do. Um, but these disagreements go really deep. And Falk's paper, Moral Perplexity, very much respects that. And, and that's the first part of the paper is him really digging into how complex things are. So. I encourage you to take a look at that too, but also you can kind of consider that more optional reading. Uh, like I said, it's not the kind of thing I'm going to spend a lot of time in my lectures discussing uh, in this first week. I'm going to focus more on the Code of Intellectual Conduct and, and, and then getting started on our next unit as quickly as possible, which is going to be this crash course on ethical theory, um, Mill, Kant, and Aristotle. Um, and I want to say a couple words about that. Um, well, I, actually, I think we can save that for later. That's okay. I'll, I'll talk about that in my next video lecture in preparation. But we're basically going to, just as I give you a quick nutshell right now, um, we're going to go right into the deep end of like some of the biggest, uh, most influential moral theories that have sort of been offered in the history of moral philosophy, in the West at least, um, although the crossover is pretty good. I, I'm big on Eastern philosophy. I, I identify uh, Buddhist and Lutheran, in case you're wondering. Uh, I'm, I'm religious. 
and I do secular philosophy. I'm kind of a weird mixed bag of a lot of things. But uh, personal questions we can talk about later. But um, these core theories are going to really expand, I love this phrase, our conceptual vocabulary for like what things we need to be tracking that are potentially of ethical or moral importance in looking at applied issues like we're going to do in the business world. So studying these theories is going to be big for giving us some more to work with, giving us more lenses to put on and look at things through. Um, to see more of what's happening. And also these readings are going to dig really deeply into issues about justification. Like what could moral truth be built on? And how do we get knowledge about that? That's, I think, a very important question. We'll talk about relativism with respect to that too. Whether we can be optimistic that there is moral truth at all. You might be skeptical of that. We'll discuss that too. Um, so that's what's kind of coming up here. And the basic nuts and bolts of the class. Um, the modules are, as much as possible, I'm going to try to have everything programmed in here. Um, but I'll be making announcements throughout the quarter and letting you know what's coming up, how things are going. If you have any questions about the instructions for these assignments, I first would point you to the syllabus because I have extensive descriptions there beyond what I've described in this video. Um, but please contact me at any time. Use my cell phone number. Send me texts. Call me up. Send me emails and I'll answer anything uh, that I can. Uh, I want you to know what's going on in this class and not have any questions about it. I hope everything will uh, turn out to be very clear, and if it's not, we can make it clear. So that's my hope. So um, this first week, uh, tomorrow, I'm going to talk about the Code of Intellectual Conduct and kind of how we have philosophical debates, um, how we do basically any type of philosophy, uh, and some kind of ground rules about how I hope we can do discussion on the boards and stuff like that too. Um, and then, and kind of like how to get into debate. How do, how do you, how can you jump into the game? Giving you a vision about that. The code of intellectual conduct is very good for that. So we'll focus a lot on that on Tuesday. And then, fingers crossed, Thursday's lecture, I can start getting into this crash course on ethical theory. So we're going to try to get through that as fast as possible so we have maximum time to be able to dig into these awesome issues uh, of controversy in the business world. So I'm really looking forward to it. I think. There's a, a lot of cool stuff that we do in this class and in this curriculum, and I'm looking forward to working with you. I, I hope I get to know as many of you as, as much as the online format lets us. Uh, if you are a student who is capable of coming to campus uh, at Bellevue College, I am available to meet in person too. I've done that in the past with online students, and that can be great. If your circumstances allow for it, you're very welcome to meet with me in person. That's always my favorite, um, so uh, maybe we can make that happen too. Let me see if I'm forgetting anything. Oh, right. This uh, Maybe let's end with this. Um, so this first week writing activity, let me pull it up. So in this assignment, there's a, kind of a questionnaire here. I've got all these questions. I'd like you to answer as many of them as you can, as deeply as you can. Uh, this is just going to be for some... Um, uh, it's going to be kind of like a the first journal assignment, effectively, but this one's more structured. Um, usually in the journals, I let you kind of do whatever you want, write on whatever you want that happened in the life of the class this week. This one's a little more guided. Uh, some of the questions are about just where you're coming from, coming into the class, about business ethics. Some of it is about you as a student. Um, and I'm very excited to kind of get to know you a little bit through you answering those questions. If you have any questions about that assignment, let me know too. Um, okay, I think I think that's everything. I think I, I hope as soon as I shut this video off, I don't forget that I wanted to talk about something. But nice to meet you. Uh, contact me uh, soon. I hope to hear from you, and I hope you're able to make the session tomorrow night if possible. But if not, maybe I can catch you on Thursday and in the future. Okay, welcome to the class.